Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this program is called Quick Study Television. It's a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year, and we're doing that today. We land again in the book of Ezekiel. It's very interesting. And we have a couple of people helping us. One of them is Corey. Corey, what's up? We are going to be focusing in on Egypt and her relationship with Judah and Jerusalem right at this time period of Ezekiel. Excellent. Very good. We look forward to that. Now, what did you do today? Well, of course, it's Friday. So that means we have a fabulous question for you from Ezekiel chapter 28. Make sure you take the time to read that chapter and be ready. Fabulous Friday question. Yes. Okay, so that's good. Okay, Ryan, we got a question, but what are you doing? Well, today we continue our studies on the alleged big three evidences for the Big Bang Theory. All right, that's good. And in a moment, Lucifer becomes Satan. How did that happen? We'll talk about it. Get your Bible guide and your Bible. Let's study. During the lifetime of Ezekiel, specifically before Jerusalem and Judah fell to Babylon, the nation of Egypt was a major player on the world scene. And we see Egypt come up in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, in Jeremiah, and in the book of Ezekiel. And that's because she was involved in the politics of the area. So let's focus in on Egypt and her role in the destruction of Jerusalem. As the Bible's recorded history approaches the fall of the nation of Judah, it begins to mention three world powers contemporary with the last several kings of Jerusalem, Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. The Assyrian Empire was on a steady decline, a revolt launched by Nebuchadnezzar, self-declared king of what he promised would become the resurrected Babylonian Empire, had begun to win major battles against the Assyrian kings. With Assyria on the run from Babylon, Judah and her capital city of Jerusalem enjoyed a time of relative freedom, and I'm sure apprehension about the shift in world powers that was occurring all around her. Famously, in 2 Kings 23 and 2 Chronicles 35, Josiah, the godly king of Judah, goes out to face Pharaoh Necho of Egypt in battle. This battle claims Josiah's life, even though the Bible is clear that Egypt's target was not Judah. Egypt was marching through Judah on her way to meet the Assyrian army at Carchemish. In the struggle against Babylon, the Assyrian Empire had called on Egypt as her ally. Together, they would face and lose battles to Babylon. In the process, however, Egypt temporarily took Judah and her kings as vassals. Pharaoh Necho appointed Jehoiakim, a son of Josiah willing to pledge allegiance to Egypt, to the throne of Jerusalem. This sworn loyalty to Egypt explains why Jehoiakim would feel brave enough to rebel against the Babylonian Empire. History tells us that Pharaoh Necho did his duty by marching up to face Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in battle over Judah. But Egypt lost, leaving Judah and Jehoiakim to face a short Babylonian siege and the first wave of exiles being taken to Babylon. Judah's leadership would make this mistake once again and against the advice of God's prophet, depend on her own strength and an allegiance with Egypt. I like to use this example of Egypt and, and her role here in the final days of uh, Judah and Jerusalem, uh, you know, as an example of why understanding your history is very important uh, for understanding the prophecies of the Bible and the narrative of the Bible. I mean, Jeremiah talks a lot about Egypt, not just in his sections of narrative, which is recording history, but also in his prophecies. And here in uh, the book of Ezekiel, we see Ezekiel prophesying about Egypt once again. Well, that prophecy doesn't really make too much sense if you haven't been paying attention to 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and done a little bit of digging into history to understand the relationship that Judah had going on with Egypt. Uh, you know, sometimes an ally of Egypt, sometimes an enemy of Egypt. Um, and, and Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon were major players on the world scene vying for power and control of the ancient Middle East. And all three of those, 
Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon had much more military might and prowess uh, over Judah, simply because they were much bigger nations than the southern nation of Judah. So Judah was kind of left uh, to figure out who they wanted to be allies with. And we see in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, these last five kings of Jerusalem, they really went back and forth with their allegiances and they failed to listen to the prophets of God who were prophesying all along what they should have been doing and who their allegiances should have been with. One thing that God Almighty expresses in his captivating speeches as they are transmitted to us is the simplicity of demonstrating how the spiritual world really works. The king of Tyre was addressed by God, but not referred to as king. You see, God spoke to the spirit that was in him, Satan. God always speaks correctly to the spiritual world as well as to us. The king was possessed and overtaken by the evil darkness, that is, the ruler of the underworld. When God spoke to him, the Lord did not mince words, but told Satan exactly what is wrong with him. The Lord God does this so that we, you and I, can hear and understand what he's saying. The prophet Ezekiel included these words in chapter 28 of his writing. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. I remember when there was a young man who came to me and asked me a question. He said, Rod, if God made everything, then did God make Satan to be evil? And that was an interesting question. And I, never, I, I said, you know, I'll answer you next week. And I did answer him next week because I wanted to research it to make sure that I was right. 
but iniquity was found inside of Satan. We're going to study about him today. It's a very interesting day to read the Bible. So get ready to uh, get your Bible out, your Bible guide. This is the August Bible guide. If you don't have yours, why not? You can write to us one of the three addresses, or you can write to us, of course, on the Bible guide or the, uh, the online webpage, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you do that, make sure you go to donate and give a donation. Any amount will take you to the PDF pages. And it'll also take you to the place where you can say, when you give, send me the Bible guide. Very, very important. Well, today we begin to focus on this. And let me explain something about our works of faith, because this is fascinating. Lucifer becomes Satan. The morning star becomes the destroyer. Lucifer becomes Satan. That's what that means. We read Ezekiel 28 to 30 to keep up going through the Bible in one year. I hope you're doing that. If not, that's fine. Uh, but we encourage you to do that. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 to 19. And as we consider what God is saying, we have to understand that, Lord, you are doing a conversation between you and Satan and help us to hear what you have said and how you've said it so we can understand in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask this and we said together, amen. As we study this, we learn from the scripture, Ezekiel 28, 11 to 13, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering and the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the oxen, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, and the emerald with gold the workmanship of your trimbles, this is interesting, your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Are you serious? Yes, I am. It is probable that Satan was involved with music on the mountain of God. This was before he was called Satan. Beloved, we must sing to the Lord a new song of forgiveness and our testimonies. In fact, it says many times in the Bible, sing to the Lord a new song. The Psalms say that, sing to the Lord a new psalm. Why is that? Or a new song? Why is that? Well, the reason is because I believe personally, and this is my own personal belief, that Satan was very instrumental in the music, worshiping God in heaven. And so... In today's world, we can sing and we can worship. And when we do worship, it is amazing because when we worship, it's not about us. It's about God. It's not about what's going to happen to us. It's about what God has done, done already. And it's very important that we understand that. So many misunderstandings about worship have been propagated and used in churches everywhere. And let me tell you something. Worship is about God. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what worship is about. We need to remember that. Anyway, let's get back to this conversation because in Ezekiel 28, 14 to 15, it says, you were the anointed, the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, the Lord says. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found inside of you. Now that's important because we see that Satan made Satan. He was perfect until iniquity, sin, and the propagation of sin was found in him. Beloved, we are born under and with sin. But when we are born again, we are born to God. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You know, he was talking to him and Nicodemus came at night. I suppose he didn't want to be seen by the other men who were part of what he was doing. You know, the Sanhedrin and all of that. And he comes to Jesus. He begins to talk to him at night. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know this. Unless you are born again, 
You cannot see the kingdom of God. So when we say born again, we're talking about Jesus Christ. We're quoting the words of Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. We need to understand what God is saying. And it's important that we also understand that a child is covered until he is able to tell the difference between good and evil. And that's very important. That same propagation is true with the Jewish children in Bar Mitzvah and Beth Mitzvah. That's very important. Anyway, Ezekiel 28, 16 to 19 say, verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you. O covering cherub from the midst of the fiery stone. Interesting. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Now that's very important. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before the kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst, from your midst, and it devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. And here's the point. God will judge Satan before the world, the whole earth. And this way we will see the kind of God he truly is. Beloved, we must choose our God well, because there is only one God. There's only one. That's something we should think about when we consider this conversation God had with Satan. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be exploring something. God is for Israel. Now, what does that mean? We're talking about that as Israel in the end of time. All of that and more coming next time on Quick Study. Make sure you make plans to join us. Right now, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, as I mentioned last week, the big three evidences that the, the Big Bang enthusiasts put forward for that theory are universal expansion, the abundance of the light elements, and the cosmic background radiation. Now, last Friday, we discovered that universal expansion cannot be used as evidence for the Big Bang Theory because universal expansion was already known about before the development of the Big Bang, and the Big Bang was actually designed around it. Today, then, we look at the other two big evidences for this theory. Let's study. When astrophysicists are questioned about why they believe the Big Bang Theory is the correct scenario for the origin of the universe, they usually put forward three main evidences. The first is universal expansion, the second is the abundance of the light elements, and third is the cosmic background radiation. However, universal expansion cannot be used as a proof for the Big Bang model, since universal expansion was already known about before the model was ever developed. Therefore, the Big Bang explains the universal expansion, but it does not predict it. The second proof of the Big Bang model suffers from the same problem. Astronomer Dr. Danny Faulkner explains. The evidence concerning the abundances of the light elements is subtler, but this too appears to be explanatory rather than predictive. The elements in question here are hydrogen, deuterium, 
a rare heavier isotope of hydrogen, the two isotopes of helium and lithium. Each of these elements would have been produced in the first few minutes of the Big Bang. All the heavier elements are presumed to have formed in stars. The Big Bang cosmology does predict the abundance of the light elements, but most people fail to realize that information concerning elemental abundances was input in creating the model. Knowledge of the light element abundances was required in constraining which subset of possible models was viable. The third proof used for the Big Bang Theory is the Cosmic Background Radiation, or CBR. This does appear to be a clean prediction of the Big Bang model, since it was first predicted nearly two decades before its discovery. Indeed, in 1964 and 1965, it was discovered that faint microwave radiation surrounds the Earth. This radiation comes from all directions in space and has a characteristic temperature. However, while the CBR is a successful prediction of the Big Bang, it actually created a major problem for it as well. The CBR has a uniform temperature everywhere in all directions. But according to theorists, the CBR's temperature in the early universe would have been very different at different places in the universe due to the randomness of the starting conditions. For the different regions to come to the same temperature, they would need to be in close contact. However, there is not enough time, even in a 14 billion year old universe, for the light to have traversed the entire universe. This is the Big Bang's light travel time problem. Much conjecture has been made to overcome this issue, however with no consensus in the scientific community, this problem yet remains unsolved. Well, I've said it many times before and I'll say it again. The Big Bang Theory is not all it's cracked up to be. And that's why even many secular scientists and professors have actually given up on it. Check out the link below if you don't believe me. As Bible believers, may we not marry the scriptures with the ever-changing pop science of the day. Instead, let's allow the Word of God to speak for itself, as it has for thousands of years before us. You know, it's true, Ryan, and, and I remember when I was uh, involved some time back, about 15, 20 years back, I used to think the Big Bang was the answer because God started the Big Bang. But really, it's, I mean, there's a lot of difficulty with that. And mm -hmm. Somebody challenged me on it, and I, I studied it, and yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, there's different models, too, that could account for what we're seeing, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. that's, well, the, that's the point as well, right? Well, that's and it's good, true. To, it's good to think about these things and, yeah, and, and ask questions about them and follow through with your, you know, not just stop, ask, ask a question and then get kind of half an answer and stop there, but to yeah. continue looking. But what Bible believers forget is that the Big Bang Theory was actually developed to replace God. That's true. That's the the fact behind it. So the I don't origins. like when I hear people saying, oh, God used the Big Bang. No, I don't think so. Well, that's one of the reasons that we have, and, and you've really taken off with this. We said that you should study this and discover it and find out. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to tell people the truth here and help them investigate and know exactly what's going on. You've got a lot of people that do that. And you too, Corey, with archaeology and theology and all the stuff you're doing, that's something that we really need to do in the next coming years. And so I want to thank both of you for the good work mm -hmm. that you've done. Excellent work on the program. Very, very good. And I know you get a lot of people who contact you for a lot of reasons, but it really is good. And I, and I know that we've had a lot of positive response on your pieces and all the things you do. So thank you. Well, thanks. we're just having fun. So, <laughs> you know, hey, thanks. <laughs> now we have, now, now we're going to thank you by giving you a question. <laughs> oh, we're, we're gonna, I don't know. We're going to mm. thank you by giving you a question. It uh, makes me feel so good when I, I present a question. Everybody's like, oh, it's the question. Well, it's if, Fabulous Friday. you got to announce it on international television, well, you which go. is, you know, that's well, a problem. Well, today, once again, it's Mercy Day because it's multiple choice. So that right. always helps. Well, I shouldn't say Sometimes it always it helps. helps. Sometimes it can Sometimes. be a little more confusing. All right. So this is a question from Ezekiel chapter 28. And it's God's proclamation against the king of Tyre. And he compares the king of Tyre to someone. And here's the setup. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, and then it's in parentheses, behold, you are wiser than, who is he wiser than? Number one, Solomon. Number two, Daniel. Number three, Joseph. What do you think? I know, but that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, you're all, I you're like know. raring to go. What do you think, Ryan? <laughs> 
No, I, I feel like he he knows this. Part. I think Daniel. That's my that's my guess. That's your, okay, that's so, your guess. So you're yeah. gonna go with him on yes. that? Yeah. I think they're right. It's a sarcastic statement. <laughs> that's that's right. Sure. It's a sarcastic yeah. statement. Because, I mean, yeah, because God's saying, you know, are you wiser than, mm-hmm. you know? Exactly. And then he, you should, if you haven't read it yet today, you should. Uh, that's absolutely right. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God, and then he says, behold, you are wiser than Daniel? Exclamation mark. So it certainly is a, a uh, sarcastic. Mark. It is. So and good job. That's Ezekiel 28, verse the, the, one of the things that is interesting to me and strikes me is that God talks to the prophets and he speaks to them and the prophets are to speak to the people mm-hmm. with his words and his words are very, you know, they're very, like he's talking to you like a regular human he's being. He's dynamic. Yes. yes. Dynamic. Yes. There's but, a lot of variety in the literary devices that he uses because he's speaking to humans. He's using human communication. Something course. that we'll understand. And of course he created humans. So yes. that's very good. It makes sense. It does, <laughs> in fact. Uh, and we have just a few more days that we need to talk about this. But in case you have not heard or understood, we realize it's still summer. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah is a, is a DVD. What's it Yes, about? it's called Introduction to Jeremiah. It's an hour and 10 minute long DVD. Half of it is a teaching introducing you to the the book of Jeremiah. So we're trying to set you up to really understand in a deeper way, in a meaningful way, the prophecies of Jeremiah. So uh, the, the teaching half of this DVD focuses in on the history of Jeremiah. You know, what's going on on the world scene? What's going on with the kings of Judah? What's going on with Babylon and Egypt and Assyria? Uh, because Jeremiah uh, dates his prophecies to specific times in this time period. Uh, so understanding our history really helps us to understand what's going on in the book of Jeremiah. The the other half is a roundtable discussion where the Quick City staff, we get together and we talk about issues that Jeremiah brings up. Uh, so our hope and desire is that this will help you to understand the book of Jeremiah. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy, it's for a suggested donation of $25. And that's important. The suggested donation is there just because the, the DVD cost us money to, to make and we've made it specifically for this. In fact, all of our products are made for this. And we want to encourage you to pray about it. I would encourage you to pray, Lord, what do we do? Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us as we are in a difficult time. And we pray, Lord, that people would be willing to pray about it and to give accordingly. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, Mm -hmm. amen. 